in one sense, it is totally falsifiable, and uh, atheists should definitely look at this. Now, there are some problems with it from an atheistic perspective, perhaps. Uh, number one, you'd be looking at it through a Catholic lens. Number two, um, it's, it doesn't appear in any journal that's peer-reviewed. However, it's still compelling. And so I just would like to talk about that for just a second. And now this comes from churchmilitant.com, and this article is from a few years ago, I believe. And uh, it's, it, it says, I quote, After scientific investigation, a Eucharistic miracle in Poland was recently confirmed as authentic by the local bishop of the area. Initially, the host had fallen on the ground, so it was placed in water, as is customarily done in such cases. Now, for those of you that don't know, the host is what is uh, what looks like bread, but is actually the body, blood, soul, and divinity of Jesus Christ. Now, not long afterward, the Eucharistic uh, the Eucharist began turning red as if it was bloody. Now, you know, in some cases, this can be mold, and this happens every once in a while, and it's tested, and it's like, okay, well, it's it's a mold. In this case, it was not. As a matter of fact, in this case. It happened to be a rare AB positive type, and uh, it also they also found the DNA, and it seemed to come from the heart. Now there was a uh, doctor that was involved in this, Dr. Friedrich uh, Zugby. He's an esteemed cardiologist and forensic pathologist at Columbia University in New York, and um, another doctor, Dr. Uh, Castanon, uh, he brought the samples to. Dr. Zugby, and he was reportedly amazed that, that when he studied the samples, they were pulsating like a living heart. They were So in other words, they were alive. The tissue sample was alive. Uh, the one uh, that came from, um, I believe, Poland. And so after the results were compared, uh, the sample from Poland, and then another sample from uh, Lanciato, Italy, which is from 1,300 years ago. So two different samples. They both turned out to be AB positive, and they both had the exact same DNA. And this caused, it was Dr. Castanano, it caused him to convert and become Catholic. So you have an atheistic doctor that converts when he sees this miracle with his own eyes. And, of course, the other scientist is... Uh, flabbergasted as well. It was completely incredible. Now, you know, atheists that are completely hardcore will cite all of these, all of the minutia, you know, never mind that the scientific method worked here. Yes, could it be repeated? Absolutely, it could be repeated. Does it need to be repeated? I'd be happy if it was. But, I mean, for me, that's enough evidence for like a hardcore atheist that's a scientist that studies this, they say what they see, what they've observed, and they convert. Well, you know, to me, that's pretty serious stuff. That's enough authority for me to be able to judge who is actually morally relativistic and who has the narrow gate, Frank. And that's what it really comes back to. It comes back to the narrow gate. Many people do not want to do those hard things that it takes to get into heaven, and that means giving up those pleasures. Yeah, it's interesting that you bring that story up because I think apart from the 2,000 year analogy of the faith, which really defines our pedigree as Catholics, uh, not only does it prove our faith, not only does it prove our civilization was built off sort of the, this, you know, Catholic analogy of the faith, but it really destroys the Protestant model of history in many ways. And so, um, but I think, you know, again, of the many ways that we can highlight sort of the role that Catholicism has played, you brought in another aspect of this. And while we have this, again, analogy of the faith, uh, we have the testimony of the of the doctors of the church, the testimony of the history of the church, uh, the, the the saints of the church and their testimonies, the popes and sort of this unbroken line of succession, you know, sort of within the history of the church through the clergy and the laity. They've all believed one and the same thing for 2,000 years. Now you bring into it the, the element of the miracle, which is, again, God's gift to highlight sort of his being and his existence to show all of us. And there's been so many of these miracles. And it's the one thing that I think Protestants truly lack. And because they're not institutionalized, they may claim some individualistic miracles. But 
in no way do they have the mechanism like Catholics have had historically to highlight the miracles that, that have taken place for 2,000 years, record them, document them, and then definitively give proof as to this is what happened. I mean, we've had the stigmatists, we've had the saints, we've had all kinds of events, you know, over the course of Christianity that highlights that Catholics can gravitate toward to find faith. You bring up the bleeding host. It's one example. You know, Padre Pew was a stigmatist. Uh, you, this was a man that bled with the five wounds of Jesus Christ. I mean, there are many sort of uh, these mystics that exist all over the world that people can find to this very day. In every generation, God gives us mystics to remind us of who he is and that he's still there. And these are God's messengers for us. God always trying to communicate for us. I know many people want the trumpets, you know, from the clouds and the heavens above to prove to them, Anthony, that somehow God exists. But it's not his method. It's not how he's always worked. Whether it's Our Lady of Good Success, which is the great prophecy for our generation and our time, or Our Lady of Fatima, or the stigmatism of Padre Pew, or the bleeding host in Poland, God is always revealing himself. Yes, we have a mainstream media that hides this. Yes, we have a mainstream media that ignores this. But if individuals want to see this for themselves, it's right there in front of our very eyes, my friend.